Welcome back, everybody. We're at the top of the midday here. It's been a really amazing, inspiring morning, and now we're at the midpoint here. I'm um, really looking forward to the upcoming conversation presentation with uh, Dr. Oscar Mwanga. And we're really fortunate today to have um, Dr. Joseph Joey Cooper with us from UMass. Um, he'll be uh, hosting and moderating. I, um, Joe, Joey has some amazing background and work in athlete activism and social justice and um, and then connecting with all of uh, Oscar's work. So I'm really excited about this upcoming conversation um, and then hearing from Oscar with his formal presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Joey for the intro and then Oscar will give his presentation. Thank you, uh, Joey. Thank, Thank you, th Oscar. Thank you, Eli. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We've had a wonderful uh, start to day two of our uh, phenomenal uh, event. And I'm very excited to introduce uh, our illustrious uh, speaker for this hour, uh, Mr. Oscar Mwanga. I'm going to give a brief overview of Dr. Mwanga's background, um, and then I will let him take over with his presentation. Um, his background involves international development, sport for development, and higher education, social entrepreneurship, and innovation. Within higher education, he's currently the program director for the International Sport Management and Innovation at the University of London. He's also an emeritus associate professor at Solent University and a visiting scholar at global institutions, including University of Tsukuba in Japan and the University of Zambia and Pan-African University in Nigeria. Within the SDP field, uh, he's a consultant with the African Union, taking a leadership role on policy review and formulation programs. Uh, he co-inspired the Sport for Development movement in Sub-Sahara Africa uh, at the turn of last century. And then during the past 20 years, he's co-founded several renowned Sport for Development programs and methodologies, including Edu Sport Foundation, Kicking AIDS Out, Sport for Development Peer Leadership, and Go Sisters. So that's just a little bit about our uh, speaker for this hour. Uh, I've had the opportunity to read uh, some of his research, He's doing excellent work, um, providing a critical lens to sport for development programming and how it's important to incorporate the framework in which he'll talk about today around Ubuntu. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce our speaker for this hour, Dr. Oscar Mwanga. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Cooper. It's, uh, it's a real honor and pleasure for me to, to, to speak uh, today at this uh, phenomenal uh, event uh, organized by the uh, Ali uh, Center. Uh, and, and it's really just uh, after so many years of working in the field, I think it's a, it's a privilege to be able to interact with uh, uh, you know, other leaders in the field that have been speaking here today. And so uh, my presentation uh, really is entitled Applying uh, the Ubuntu as a, a mentorship framework uh, for uh, the next generation of sport uh, for social change leaders. Um, my plan will be to just really answer uh, some key fundamental questions to guide me through the talk. Uh, my purpose um, is, is really to just try to um, argue the case uh, for Ubuntu, which is an African uh, ideology and African philosophy as a framework through which we can deliver mentorship, which is obviously uh, crucial for uh, you know, uh, personal development and community development as well. So through my talk, I would like to go through those uh, uh, key points there. I would like to um, answer why uh, mentorship is important. I know that has already been addressed. I'll just reiterate that. Uh, I'll be talking about, uh, in addition to that, I'd like to really address the question, why do we need uh, Ubuntu uh, mentorship or Ubuntu as a framework uh, for delivering mentorship? Um, so uh, then I would like to go and introduce the, the, uh, the, AGUS, the, the AGUS Sport Mentorship Program uh, that I've been involved with for the past 20 years. 
uh, like uh, Dr. Cooper said, that I, I co-founded at the turn of the century in Zambia. And uh, then I will sort of like identify some principles that we can try to uh, look into as a way to understand how we are able to uh, use Ubuntu as a, as a framework. After that, uh, I hope to engage uh, our, 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 our attendees and uh, colleagues uh, through a question and answer uh, session. So then, uh, two key questions there. Why mentorship? Uh, and why do we need uh, Ubuntu um, uh, as a framework? It would be easy for me to, 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 to kick out by saying the current framework, I argue, is not serving the purpose of um, the participants that have been involved with uh, that work, uh, particularly in the African context. But as well as we see the world today and the crisis that we face in terms of uh, what we ex we're experiencing as a global um, sort of like disruption around what it means um, to understand racism and how much uh, we've been challenged as a people, you know, uh, Africans and black people in terms of um, suffering uh, discrimination for the past, uh, you know, discrimination, colonialism and slavery for the past 400 years. Uh, would like to try to think that part of the colonial legacy is really about uh, making sure that we create this idea that the African does not really have his own ideology, the African does not really have uh, his own philosophy upon which to structure and uh, deliver their own program. So that idea then creates a vacuum in the African context so that what presents is just Western models of, of, of delivering a, a program. So as a key point, why Ubuntu mentorship? It's because we need to start to look to alternative uh, uh, um, uh, sort of like methodologies, but we also need to, to, to question the current global uh, frameworks of, 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 of economy, uh, global from frameworks of, of, of the way we structure our thought and ask the question, uh, is it serving the purpose of, of what this is about? So then back to the first question, which is uh, why mentorship? Uh, I think I would like to start with my, my story. And my story um, is really about um, if we want to look far, as Newton said, uh, Isaac Newton, we need to stand on the shoulders of giants. Now, for me and many other people uh, that have spoken before me today, you will agree that the first giants uh, if you're lucky to have uh, your parents or you know guardians, they are the fundamental giants for you because they they give you the values, they give you the the the, the foundation, the base upon which you're going to start to uh, to structure your life. From the day you open your eyes to the day you close your life, uh, your eyes, what you you start with is your parents, and and in the image there, what you see is a. Uh, is, is my myself and my my, my father and, and 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 my mother uh they've been crucial um in in my education they inspired me to think of um myself as a person that can be bigger than uh what has been prescribed uh, within my society so my my parents uh came from a very humble background my dad was a, a, a military uh, person my mom was a was a nurse but they believed that uh, I could achieve. Uh, and, and so they gave me that opportunity. Um, so I was raised very much within uh, you know, an urban context, but I, I also had an opportunity to go to the, to the village, the African village, to learn the ways of my, my tribe, which are, the, uh, are from the southern part of Zambia, and they're called the Tongas. So uh, in, the, in the image there, you see, uh, you know, a young uh, fellow there with, with 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 cows or cattle behind behind him. Well, that is part of my education. Uh, and my dad would say, if you want to be a leader of people, you gotta understand how you lead uh, and animals. So, uh, so we had to go into the village context and learn, uh, you know, so many lessons around that. But um, from that humble background, I would um, have an opportunity to to have an education. Uh, I have, uh, I acquired a PhD and I like to say I am an accidental, accidental doctor because I was not 
book smart. I was not somebody that was gifted academically, but I met um, uh, uh, mentors, uh, teachers along the way that guided me and gave me that opportunity to actually believe uh, in, in my uh, ability. They showed me that even if I was not academically gifted, actually I had different gifts and with training, I would aspire to, to achieve what I have achieved. So uh, without a bragging or boasting, um, the point I am trying to make here is that everyone has got the capacity to be a giant. You just have to stand on the shoulders of giants. And you have to appreciate the fact that where you come from, the, the history of people that have gone before you is, is being passed on to you. So it's like a baton. So I get a baton from uh, my, my, my father and, and my mother, and then I pass on the baton to the next generation. And this is what this talk really is about. So in this image here, it's myself in the middle, um, and then it's my father and, and my son. And, and again, that depicts again the idea of how do you um, make sure that you're, you're passing on uh, you know, to the next generation. And then uh, that was my, at my graduation uh, years back in 2012, uh, uh, when I graduated at the University of uh, uh, Leeds in, uh, University in, in, uh, here in England. So coming to the other side, uh, as I journeyed on, um, mentorship for me did not just end with my parents, it, it continued to uh, when I went to train as a PE teacher. I met somebody that spoke into my life and believed in me. And uh, that's the image of uh, Professor uh, uh, Musheke Kakua, who, who is uh, uh, the late now. He once whispered to me, he said, you love sport, you also are a disciplined person you're going to go very far. And those words meant everything for me. And I, I began to, to journey in my life in that direction. Um, I, in 1997, I'd gone to, to leave Zambia to go and study in Norway to do my, my degree in sports science at the Norwegian, at the Norwegian University of Sports Science. Um, and then I would travel between Zambia and Norway to sort of like, you know, set up my ideas of this Edge Sport Foundation. And along the way, I had an opportunity to speak at conferences and at what conference when, where I spoke, I had an opportunity to actually meet uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu, who was, uh, in, who was a mentor for me uh, uh, growing up in Zambia. We followed the story in South Africa. Uh, around uh, you know the struggle against apartheid, so that was very important that I, I, I you know I, I got to present myself to to the cause of our people as we were you know helping Zambia was helping other countries around the region to liberate from uh, from the you know from from the colonialists. Um, but speaking in terms of uh, the opportunity that I have now. Um, to, you know, today to speak at the uh, Ali Center. I think I have, a, I have a bit of an interesting story because the image that you see here of the, of the boxer down there is, uh, was a legendary Zambian boxer who was the light heavyweight uh, champion um, in Zambia in the 80s, and his name was Lord Timwale. Now, Lord Timwale was the Commonwealth champion and the African champion then and you know, for, for five years um, in the 80s. Um, when I was growing up, I, I was introduced to boxing by my father. I didn't know if I loved boxing that much, but as I, as I began to get into the, into, the, you know, into the spirit and understanding the, the, the game, I appreciated uh, uh, aspects of boxing, uh, you know, you know, not getting hit or, you know, to the head, but not getting hit to the head, but you know, other aspects of it that I really appreciated. But I remember one time uh, where I grew up in the military camp, uh, training and then Lord Timwale stepped in on that day and he trained with us and uh, he came and whispered to me he said he enjoyed my footwork he, he liked the way I moved my feet when we were doing shadow spiling well it goes the, the story goes that actually Lord Timwale did have uh, you know a training practice with the legend and, and the great Muhammad Ali at some point so I you know I, I was really excited to hear about that but the other exciting news and uh, story for me was that I actually opened up, um, uh, you know, a fight as a young man. I, I, I fought at the Zambian Independence Stadium to open up uh, one of the fights for the legendary uh, Lotimwale, who was our, uh, our, our champion then. 
So the other question then that we look at now is why then do we uh, think that mentorship is important? Um, I, I, I did a, sh a small survey and uh, asked about 47 uh, former participants uh, that I worked with over the years, and all of them identified uh, uh, mentorship as, as a key component in their success. But we can see recent studies that support that view as well. You know, 75% of executives credit their, mentor, uh, uh, their mentors with helping them uh, reach their current position. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, you can see there as well that um, as many as 75% of millennials deem mentoring as crucial, uh, you know, for the, um, you know, crucial for their success. But unfortunately, only 40% uh, of these uh, millennials actually have access to good uh, uh, mentorship. So we have to identify this as a, as a crucial um, uh, aspect of, uh, of, of, of personal development for our young people going forward within the field of sport for development, but across the world. Uh, another statistic which is, which is a bit, uh, which is crucial as well, is that when you look at this, uh, you know, research normally to target uh, predominantly white populations uh, in, in the Western society. So when we, when we start to look at minorities, uh, the statistics are, are not uh, that good uh, in terms of the number of minorities that have access to good mentorship. So to actually understand uh, what um, a, a, an Ubuntu mentorship uh, framework looks like, I think it's important for us to really define what Ubuntu is. If you if you go on you know to Google, you appreciate that Ubuntu is now a buzzword, uh, but Ubuntu is really as defined by uh, Tutu there, a person is a person through other persons. Uh, none of us comes into the world fully formed. Uh, we would not know how to think or walk or speak or behave as humans unless we learned it from other humans. We need other humans in order to be human. So Ubuntu is really about my humanity being completed in your humanity. So it's, it's an ideal of being human through our actions and through what we do. Um, so you see that um, Ubuntu is fairly consistent with certain uh, worldviews uh, uh, in, in, in Asia, I, I believe also the worldview of, of Native Americans, uh, that actually uh, we are connected and, and our humanity is completed in others. Uh, I believe the shortest poem was given by the legend and great Muhammad Ali, who said, me, we. What did he mean by that? I argue that he meant that we are nothing without others, which for me was a confirmation and an appreciation of Ubuntu uh, by uh, Muhammad Ali there. So if I start to go to speak about uh, the Edge Sport Foundation as a case study, I guess the best point to start is to start from is to sort of like celebrate some of the success that we have achieved um, as edu as edu sport over the years when we set up edu sport in uh, 1990 we were addressing one of the difficult more times of our country which was around addressing the problem of hiv aids uh, uh, epidemic so the vision of edu sport was around using sport as a tool to educate young people about HIV AIDS. The, the methodology that we were going to use or that we used was identifying young leaders that we called peer leaders and uh, we gave them opportunities to, to get training, to, be, to become mentors in their communities, to become coaches and to become leaders. So at the turn of the century, we worked with uh, of, of the past century, we worked with a group of girls, we worked with uh, young men in, in, in various communities across Zambia. And for the past 20 years, they have gone on to make not just individual changes in their lives, but to make, to, to impact structural changes within sport and in, within education in Zambia. So some, some examples there that we can think about um, is in 2012, Zambia won the African uh, Nations uh, football tournament. And in that team, uh, right here on the, on, on the bottom uh, uh, right there, uh, we had four players coming from the Edu Sport Foundation. 
uh, football club and they are uh, in the top uh, picture there. You see them um, after they won uh, Gothia Cup in Sweden. Um, but the current team for women that is going to the Olympics in Zambia ha has been led by former age sport players. So the leadership of women football in Zambia is been strongly influenced by uh, these young leaders that, 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 that have come from, from age sport. And, um, you know, so we, wh what we see is that over the years, these young people have gone into places where they've been able to influence uh, change, not just within their lives, but in the lives of other people. So here are some few examples of some of these young people that have come through the, the program. Uh, here I have uh, Ani Namkanga. Ani Namkanga came to uh, AG Sport uh, in, in, uh, you know, in 1999. She received training. Um, it was very uh, unusual for girls to, to step out of home, of home space to go and you know, interact in the football space. That was really something that we had to work with. We had to engage with our parents. Um, Annie went on to do her degree at Loughborough University through Loughborough College here in England. And when she graduated, she's gone back and she's leading the Go Sisters program under Age of Sport. But what's interesting for me over the years is that Annie, uh, Annie Namkanga has mentored very serious uh, uh, people in the Zambian sports landscape. Uh, including the, the young gentleman there. His name is Lyson Zulu. Lyson Zulu is currently the technical director at Football Association of Zambia. He too went to Lafla uh, University. Um, on, on, on top there, we have uh, uh, um, uh, Phoebe Piri, who's set up our own organization. And then here we have, um, uh, what's his name again? Yeah, Mike Konkosi, who is now um, you know, running a program called Youth Life in, in, in Zambia. So we see also how they are, the two of them, Lyson and, and, and Michael, set up another organization or another movement called Umutima, which is really the sort of like the millennials uh, description of, of Ubuntu. So they said, you know, trying to inspire from the heart, uh, trying to connect the, the hearts of the community. And there is, they would then inspire a Zambian activist who's a leading musician in Zambia uh, with their brand, which is called the Umutima brand. And uh, his name is Pilato. And Pilato, for you know the Zambians out there, they know that Pilato is a very strong political activist and uh, sometimes not in good boots, uh, books with the government. But he is actually inspiring a lot of young people to, to enhance their voice. So um, if we then close into Ubuntu as a transformative uh, a mentorship framework. Uh, what kind of, uh, sort of like, what kind of elements do we see? Number one, we talk about uh, the ontological perspective. So by ontological perspective here, we mean, what is the, the nature of, of, of ultimate truth when you, when, you, when you speak about Ubuntu? Well, Ubuntu is, the development of trust is a development of, of confidence. It's, it's about mutual respect between the student and the mentor. So we believe in Ubuntu that there is a participatory nature to uh, our reality, that we are, we are dependent on others and others are dependent on us to create this ecosystem that all of us exist in. Uh, so the values that arise uh, from Ubuntu closely um, align uh, with uh, communalism, uh, cohesion, respect, generosity, uh, mutual care, uh, you know, consensus. These same sort of like, uh, you know, values or, 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 or definers or pillars of Ubuntu are crucial in creating the relationship-centered paradigm. So um, mentorship, whether in the Western um, perspective or, 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 in the, or, or in the African perspective is about relationship fundamentally. So you see that Ubuntu squarely uh, and strongly aligns with this idea of, uh, of, 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 of relationship-based uh, or centered paradigm. So what you see within the African context is we talk about a child uh, being, uh, you know, we say to, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. So basically what we, 
we, we look at there is to say, when you have a child, it's not just a responsibility of the parents, it's a responsibility of the teacher, it's a responsibility of the uh, religious leaders in the community, it's a responsibility of the, of, of the healthcare system. Everyone is involved basically in raising the child. So within uh, that thinking, uh, sorry. Oops. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, let me just go back. Uh, okay. Um, I believe I was, yeah, I was there. Apologies for that. Uh, so what we, what we, what we see there is that actually within the African uh, Ubuntu framework, we see a child as a responsibility of the wider community as opposed uh, to a child just being the responsibility of, of, of the parents. And when we are raising a child, we bring everyone together. Um, so we also say with the, there was also a proverb in Africa that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So that resonates with myself. Um, I, I managed to achieve a PhD uh, being, I think, the first Zambian since uh, independence to have a PhD in sports science. But I did go fast. I didn't go far because that doesn't reflect the level of education that my colleagues in Zambia have uh, within sport. So we don't have enough people with this qualification. Therefore, I have to go back and you know, pass on the baton of education to the next generation so we can have more people in different areas of sport, you know, uh, having that qualification so we can influence uh, uh, many through uh, the benefits of participating in sport uh, in terms of healthy living and in terms of, uh, you know, winning medals and building the pride of the nation. But it's important that we caution against uh, romanticizing Ubuntu as an ideal. They are elements of Ubuntu that promote uh, uh, you know, uh, lack of transparency where uh, uh, elders that are highly respected in African society can take advantage of children uh, or can take advantage of, of people that are under their care because the, the structure of, of Ubuntu is such that it does not encourage, you know, uh, being um, sort of like challenging the system. So, um, it's very important to understand that we do not want to believe that Ubuntu is a sportless uh, ideology or, or, or a sportless philosophy. What we need to understand is that it is, it is uh, an ideal that we work with. It's an ideal that we aspire to, uh, to achieve. So if I then go to this slide and uh, try to bring in the question then, how do we uh, apply Ubuntu as, uh, as a framework, and I suggest seven principles there. Uh, the first one is uh, consciousness rising. Uh, the second one that I've identified over the years is time and commitment, uh, respect, explicit cultural references or uh, explicit worldview references, inclusion, care, and story. So I'm going to quickly see if I can go through this, if, uh, if, if time allows me uh, to just identify how each one of these uh, helps to contribute towards uh, the Ubuntu as a, as a framework for mentorship. So number one, um, consciousness rising uh, or what we call uh, 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 awakening is really about helping young people as we pass on the baton to them to actually understand that most of their behaviors are habitual and culturally framed. So what does that mean? What it means is that they, we rarely as humans reflect on things we do within our cultural uh, context. We do them because we're just raised in that uh, system. But as we uh, help to implement Ubuntu, it's important uh, to help our young people to actually see that they need to be mindful, they need to be aware of what is happening within their, their personal life and how that connects to their social life and how that, that connects to political issues. Uh, most of the young people that I've worked with over the years who come from a, uh, uh, a socioeconomically uh, challenging background, 
And sometimes people who are in those backgrounds, such as myself at one point in my life, tend to think that they are poor because they, they don't have the skills or they're poor because they didn't work hard enough. Sometimes you are poor just because you're born in a particular location in the world. Sometimes you're poor because the global system does not empower the place where you find yourself. So it's important that as you go through and are helping them to build this um, uh, sort of like understanding of how you mentor them, consciousness rising is going to be key um, uh, way of, of, of engaging with them. The second point there is, is about time. Um, when we think of time within the context of Ubuntu, it's very interesting actually, because time is not um, seen in terms of using it to achieve a particular outcome. So within many Western models of, of mentoring, you know, you meet and you have to go through things, especially in the, in the formal mentoring setup, you have to go through particular skills that you are expected to acquire. You know, maybe we, we do uh, uh, a training so you can acquire some particular skills. And that happens within a, a designated time a time frame. Ubuntu says the biggest gift you can give another person is your time. And the person that receives that gift appreciates the value of it because that time is invested in the process. The process where the two uh, you know, meet together to create moments that are meaningful in the development of each other. It's not just in the development of, 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 of the mentee, it's also in the development of, of, of the mentor because you cannot be an expert of all dimensions of life. You are an expert within one area and you would actually be surprised as I am surprised these days that the young people that I've worked with over the years are, they refer to me as their mentor and I actually say, well, you're my mentor as well because it is a core learning uh, process and that core learning process happens over time. Um, so um, some of the young people that I've mentored over the years uh, who, for instance, came over to England to join me for their education, we continued the mentorship program in contexts that were informal. We, when we sat at the table, we talked about things that are important. Uh, when we, we did things that are not related to their program, they saw my character and maybe there's something that they, they learned from that. Um, so it's all on the wings of time. So time and commitment is, uh, is, is, is crucial in this framework. Respect. Um, this is a core value uh, that I believe is central uh, when we talk about this mentorship program. So what do we mean by respect? We, it's not just to say, um, you know, use somebody's title to refer to them or to say thank you or to just use, to verbalize respect. Uh, respect in the Ubuntu context really starts with appreciation. You must appreciate the complexity of the other person's humanity. You must appreciate their history. You must appreciate where they are, their culture. You must appreciate where they are going in their life. So when we are passing on the baton to these young people, to these uh, people that are, are now behind us, we are thinking of how do we respect them, starting with uh, appreciation. The next point there, which is crucial, which is a crucial pillar in the Ubuntu framework, is uh, is being explicit about the, uh, uh, the worldview. So there's an assumption that you know when you're mentoring, um, uh, when the mentor is, you know is in charge of the mentoring process, uh, you know it's 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 not important to appreciate that the the mentee has a particular culture, has a particular worldview. Now this is very common in 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 the context of sport for development that I've worked because. Um, most of the people designing programs for mentorship, most of the people implementing these programs will normally be middle-class white males. And what you see is that um, the mentee who's coming from an African context might decide not to engage with their culture and might de decide to shun their culture. And that be becomes a project that's not sustainable. It is not sustainable because people must grow from within their culture, from within their worldview. So it's very important really to actually understand that we need to be explicit about our worldview. So as we interact in the mentorship experience, it's important to, to be explicit about how do we make sense of, of things? What does it mean um, you know, 
to, to exist in one's world. What is one's world? Um, I, I, I've had the privilege of, of, of mentoring people of a different gender over the years. So it was important also to be explicit about my own uh, you know, upbringing from a society which is predominantly uh, masculine. So what kind of worldview do I inject into the process of mentorship and how problematic is that? So it's very important that this is brought to um, an explicit level. Um, over the years as well, um, it has been important for me to include uh, the people that I have mentored. Um, it, it's, uh, it's scary uh, by inclus inclusivity, we mean um, we need to warmly include the mentee in areas where their growth is going to be challenged, but it's going to grow. So you, we, in Africa, we say you don't get the butterfly without the struggle. So the, the, you know, the, 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 you know, it has to come out of the cocoon to define its beauty and to be able to, you know, to fly off with, with its beauty. So it's important really to say, how uh, do we include them? So uh, I remember when we had our first uh, national girls tournament, um, I promised uh, Annie Namkanga, who I've spoken about, that I would speak as the president of Edge Scott Foundation back in 2001, I believe it was. But I knew that I wasn't going to speak because I wanted to help create a culture that women's programs would be driven by women. And uh, on that day, uh, a week before that, I asked her to to prepare a backup speech because I wasn't. I, I, I lied to her really. I said I wasn't sure if I would be there. And then uh, on that day, I came and I said I forgot my speech. So then she had to speak on that on 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 on, uh, on that event. Uh, what that created today is we have now a culture where that event is completely run by uh, by women and girls and no men actually speak there so again we had to put her in a space where she felt uncomfortable but it was in that uh, you know zone where her growth was and she's obviously been able to to use that model so inclusivity is is a very uh, important pillar as well uh, if i can just quickly go to to this pillar of care or this principle of care um for me, it's the modality that underpins community. It's, 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 if you don't, I, I like to ask uh, this question to the people I've worked with over the years. And the question is, did you think I cared enough? And uh, you can't fake care. Uh, the people that you work with, they'll know that you care for them. And when you care for them, they will feel appreciated and they will grow. And, and that is just a human response when there is an environment and a culture of care. So for me, this is a very fundamental uh, pillar in the, in the Ubuntu uh, framework. Um, story uh, for me uh, has been a, a definer really uh, for what we do. Um, stories have been the perspective or the lens through which we make sense of our existence. So stories is, is a powerful way to, 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 to open up the mentoring uh, process. It's, a, it, it's also embedded within the African culture that we, we, are, we, are, peoples, we are peoples of stories. Uh, so all the stories that I bring to my mentorship and all the stories that I receive help to define the whole um, mentorship experience. Um, so really, I just rushed through those points. So in conclusion, I, I'd just like to say that, um, you know, it won't happen uh, without our uh, mentees being uh, awakened. Um, it won't happen if we don't invest time. It won't happen if we don't uh, respect them in their full humanity. It will not happen if we don't uh, uh, if we're not explicit about um, our worldviews that we bring into the process, uh, it won't happen if we do not include them, if we don't care for them, and if we don't invite and share stories. So um, there's a, a story I'd like to share as I, as I end there. You know, it's, it's the one in the image there. When we started um, uh, the Edge Sport Foundation in Zambia, we, we, we used homemade footballs as a way to fundraise. So we used to ask the young people to say, there's nothing wrong to play with a homemade football. Um, and we called, it, we called it chimpomo in Zambia, which means you know, you know, that which is made from plastics. So we used to get those footballs. And when our players went to participate in the Norway Cup in, in Norway and Sweden, we actually sold the footballs with a story of saying, this is where these great footballers come from. 
and then we were able to raise a few dollars to support the program. So when we came back to the community with you know, um, uh, you know, footballs that are made, you know, uh, you know, the standard footballs, the young people in the community, they would ask, really, did this, did you actually get this football from this homemade football? And you could have seen the eyes and, and the pride um, that came with that. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's my presentation. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate uh, your time. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Cooper, it's uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. <clears throat> I can uh, attest from the comments in the chat that um, several of our attendees are, are very appreciative for your insights and um, your presentation and analysis of Ubuntu. Um, it's very important. Um, I thought, you know, your connection between African cultural systems and worldviews and the synergy with cultures across the globe was was well stated. Um, we do have one question in the chat uh, from Carolyn, uh, and Carolyn mentioned uh, in the in the chat as well that in Filipino culture, um, there's a worldview called uh, Kapwa K A P K A P W A, um, and she mentioned that Ubuntu and Kapwa are are very much uh, in synergy. Uh, her question was. How can organizations who adopt communal worldviews in the United States get funding when systems of individualism and oppression create barriers to that funding? So essentially her question, similar to a question that I had as well is, in your experiences, when you encounter an ideological conflict, whether it be from a source of funding, a government entity, a NGO, uh, a community, how do you ideologically, structurally, and interpersonally overcome that conflict? So uh, essentially Carolyn's talking about neoliberalism, which is a, a prominent ideology in Western societies, whereas the Ubuntu framework that you're promoting um, and that you enact is uh, more common within African cultural systems. Well, very, very good uh, question, uh, Karen, and I appreciate that and, and hope I'll be able to provide some insight from my experiences. Um, most of the programs that we run uh, or that, have, uh, that have been involved with over the years depend on Western uh, donor funding. So the funding comes with, I like to say, with a package in it, which is the ideology. The program is not just a description of what you're going to achieve. The program itself it comes from a particular worldview. And if you are going to evaluate, you're going to implement the program, first implement and then evaluate, you're actually measuring against uh, a, a particular value system. And uh, unfortunately, it's a big struggle because um, you will always have the conflict. Uh, you know, so there are, there, there are times when um, you will have to manage the conflict in terms of uh, the young people in the programs, uh, you know, being conflicted, not understanding exactly what is going on. On one side, you're asking them to, you know, to, to actually build a strong sense of community. And on the other side, you're asking them to be individuals, to be individualistic, because that is what they're expected to be according to the description of the program. So I'll give, I'll, I'll, I'll give some examples here. Um, when I, uh, uh, we had a, a certain rule in our program in the Age of Sport Football Academy that said, uh, for you to receive funding uh, to, go to, to go to school, you must do community work. So we used to say, you do something for your community, we do something. You do nothing, we do nothing. So some of these young people went away and did amazing in their community. And as they did that work, which initially did not appreciate, they began to see that they were actually not doing anything for their community, they were doing something for themselves because they are members of that community. And if that community got better, their lives got better as well. So they had an appreciation of that. And through that, they realized that they had to pick particular skills. They had to learn how to be punctual. They had to learn how to organize themselves. Those were the skills that they would then go on and use in the workplace. So I have uh, a, a young man called Paul Simwengwa. He's a thriving uh, manager in a big fishing uh, company in Zambia. And he has now been using that company as a, as a motivator across departments uh, because of the experiences that he got from serving his community. 
But then on the other side, we had players that didn't like that model. Um, they, they were talented in football. So we had two players that actually went to Real Madrid for trials um, from our program. And they stated to me once and said, you know, we like this whole thing, especially when they had been to Europe and they had all, all that confidence. They're like, you know, but we don't buy into this. You know, I, I've got my own family. I've got to take care of myself. So this is the way I'm going to go. And, uh, and they don't mind me mentioning their names. Uh, one of them is still the top scorer in the Zambian league now. He's gone back to Zambia. His name is Roger Kola. So Roger Kola came to me and said, uh, recently, actually, I think three years ago, he said, you know what? The things that you try to do, I appreciate them now. Because his young brother is also playing with him. He's a, he's a second striker at the same club he's at, which is a top club in Zambia called Zanako. And his young brother has been trying to, you know, to go to, uh, to Europe. And he came to me and said, let's get this guy to school. Let's get this guy to do some community work. That stuff is very important. So this is the guy that initially had told me it wasn't important to, you know, to, 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 to be part of the community and to serve the community. So, the, so there's going to be conflict at individual level um, in terms of trying, the young people trying to understand how they're going to develop. And um, you know, you try to negotiate that, but what would be easy is if uh, the wider paradigm we're talking about here, as we experience this disruption in the world, one of the things that I see, for instance, here in the UK, uh, uh, Boris, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has announced that uh, the, the, their, their, their organization that is in charge of international funding called DFID is going to be merged with the foreign affairs. So basically, they are re-strategizing their international aid. And one of the countries that's going to suffer is Zambia. Zambia won't receive aid from the UK. Now, you could look at that and say, oh, that's not good. But hey, from the 60s, since Zambia has received aid, and uh, uh, you know, have we seen development because of aid? Aid model has not worked for us. Uh, aid model is dehumanizing itself. It, it, it's against Ubuntu. You, you actualize by engaging in your own community, solving problems, and that is how you grow, by interacting in your space. So if you inject aid all the time, you stop to interact and you start waiting for the aid. So I believe that Zambia will go through a difficult phase, but in that process, Zambia will start to look at themselves. Zambia will start to look at themselves, within themselves, to search for that. And in that process, I believe, they'll start searching for their own paradigm, their own worldview, to say, what saves us? Uh, and, and our forefathers, like Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, uh, Nyerere of Tanzania, they had conceptualized development models based on, on, on Ubuntu. The struggle was that they didn't have uh, enough funding because conditions did not prevail then. So when we, had a, we have a wider national framework that uh, embodies, embodies Ubuntu and you have resources to do that, it becomes easier. But when you are depending on others to finance your education, finance your, prog your programs, it becomes a very big conflict. No, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent, excellent uh, response. And um, I think that's important for all of our attendees uh, to think critically about a common theme in a lot of our uh, presentations has been, you know, this idea of having a critical uh, approach to engaging in mentoring, to engaging in sport for development work and understanding that there is an ideological conflict that, you know, mm -hmm. just because an entity is willing to provide aid and willing to provide support, it from a value system level is contradictory to the community uh, in need that um, you can think more creatively about pursuing funding to create that program. Uh, and like you said, not feeling like you have to rely on on that source. So I want to thank you again, Dr. Mwanga, for that that comment. Uh, uh, Eli, wonderful, excellent. Um, still, still, maybe uh, one more question, perhaps. Yeah, um, if you like, and then we we put we should uh, wrap up uh, to transition to the next. Maybe one one more question, or if you. If you okay, I uh, I didn't see another question in the chat. Okay. I may be. Oh, I think Mohammed okay. uh, Althani uh, asked a question. Is the framework similar to Freire's critical pedagogy or is it more centered towards uh, the mentor expertise? So I think uh, the question is asking is Ubuntu 
Uh, does it relate to Paulo Freire, um, Brazilian scholars, critical pedagogy, or is it more centered towards uh, the mentor expertise? Very, very excellent question there. Uh, I'm familiar with pa Paulo Freire's work. He's, he's one of my distant uh, uh, mentors, um, and, and I appreciate uh, uh, the work that he, he did. So the answer is that um, when we apply um, uh, you know, our, uh, the model in our, in our work, we apply fair and principles. And one of the principles that we apply is, uh, is, is, is consciousness rising. Basically, it, it's allowing the, the mentee to appreciate that they are a political entity themselves, that mm -hmm. they, they are defined by the political system that, um, you know, surrounds their, you know, that, 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 that is in, within their ecosystem. So it's important that they, they, they begin to understand that, uh, you know, they can problematize the education, which sometimes is, is a colonial education, as it were, which promotes a particular legacy of, of colonialism. Uh, and, and they can begin to build a certain consciousness that allows them to build from within their community, uh, so from within themselves. So there are some synergies between Ubuntu and, and, and fair and uh, uh, pedagogy, but I wouldn't say that they are one and the same thing. Uh, so you borrow certain elements from uh, Paulo Freire and you use them as pillars uh, when implementing programs. So there are similarities, uh, but not the same thing. Thank you. Excellent. Well, great. Well, thank you so much to both. And um, yeah, thank you, uh, Oscar, and uh, wonderful, amazing, all the comments and every, everyone is loving. And, uh, and Dr. Cooper, thank you, uh, Joey, um, for, for taking the time to moderate and being with us. The synergy between the two of you and all your great work, amazing work, is, is very powerful.